Good morning. And welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. I'm Lori Baining, Associate Pastor for Congregational Care. And yes, you can sit down, Nancy. That's fine. <laughs> um, it's kind of warm today. It's going to be warm. I know this is the traditional service, but Cease Garrett said I could go without wearing my robe. So I hope that's okay for all of you. So <laughs> But good morning. If uh, you have not had the opportunity to do so, please sign the red friendship pad, who's who in the pew. Uh, take a look at it, sign, uh, pass it on down, and then send it back again so you can take a look at the names of others who have also signed. And that way, if there's someone that is sitting in the row with you that you have not met, please make sure you say hello before you leave the sanctuary today. Our bulletin is cram full with lots of information, activities going on here in the life of the church. Uh, please read through them. You'll notice on the green sheet, also Vacation Bible School is fast approaching. And so please uh, consider ways that you might be involved with VBS this year. There's lots of different needs. Doesn't mean being here on Sunday morning. It might mean providing food for snacks, a variety of ways. So please do um, pray about how you can be part of the Vacation Bible School opportunities coming up. This morning you will uh, find at 10.30 we have a general assemb assembly update with uh, Barnabas over in the worship hall. I invite you to stay and uh, hear just kind of the updates about what took place in Pittsburgh this past week uh, with our denomination. And if you're not able to stay for the class with Barnabas, you can go on the PCUSA website and other sources as well to um, hear the latest news as well. Also, you'll see on Saturday, we're having a work day just in the morning, hopefully done by noon. Uh, for anyone who's able to come out and help clean up the kind of the side yard a bit over there in preparation for our church picnic that is going to be happening on the 4th of August. So if you have a, a pair of gloves and a couple hours on Saturday morning, come on out and be part of that. Next Sunday, we will have a Haiti update here uh, in our traditional services. The Haiti team got back, boy, just last week, Sunday, I guess, at uh, about 3 o'clock in the morning or so. And um, they are looking forward to the youth are going to be uh, leading most of worship next week and sharing some of their experiences. We wanted to do it on a Sunday morning so that uh, as many of the church family could be here as possible and to uh, hear this update because so many of our church family uh, supported our young people as well. So we'll be looking forward to that also. Please take note also in the bulletin of uh, our food pantry and some important needs uh, that we have with that ministry here at the church as well. And I invite you to consider those announcements and prayerfully consider that ministry opportunity as well. It is a joy to gather on a Sunday morning here in worship. If you have not uh, come to Westminster before, if this is the first time that you have visited, uh, we have our welcome wagon host or hostess will be out in the narthex afterwards. We just have a small gift for you that we'd like to give you just to say welcome and that we're glad that you are here. If you don't have a church home, please know that um, you are always invited uh, to join and be part of this church family. If you, I know it's summer, people are in and out of town quite a bit. Come on and sit down, guys. That's okay. Everybody, you've got this little crowd standing at the door there. Come on in, Galen, Ray. Yeah, Galen and Ray, come on in and sit down. <laughs> we have been doing a series on the Word of God, the Scripture. Uh, since, actually, uh, I thought it was very nice. We started it on June 13, I believe it was, Bible Presentation Sunday. And so we've been doing a study on the Word of God. If you've not seen all the sermons because you've missed being out of town, please go on the church website and get caught up. I'm just so blessed to be work with two other pastors who preach the Word of God, my friends, every Sunday, boy. And so if you've not seen the, the sermons, please go online and uh, check them out. But as kind of a little reminder for all of us here, it's Barnabas started out the series with a sermon on God's word in a postmodern world. Okay, in today's culture where personal experience means everything, that is to say people trust people who have experiences 
more than they trust the experts who just talk about it. So if we are going to connect with God's word with a postmodern world, we need to know God's word and live God's word. Experience God's word. And then people will listen to us. And then Christ, then Chris preached on one of his favorite topics, the authority of Scripture. The Bible has a unique power and authority all of its own because it gets its power and authority from God. Okay? No other book has that kind of power and authority. And so in an age and in a culture that says, I am the creator of my own truth. My experiences define truth for me. Or truth is different for every person. We need to ask ourselves, am I willing to let something else, someone else, be the authority over every area of my life? Does scripture have final authority for you? Now, interpreting the Bible, really understanding God's word and making sense of it, it that can be a tough thing, right? And so the next, ser the next sermon was uh, Barnabas preached on a passage from 1 Timothy 2 to show how we need to use God's word to interpret God's word. If you didn't hear that sermon, it's a really important text for St. Timothy 2, and I encourage you to go to the website. It's on uh, men and women and authority in the church, and so it's important to me, and the, I was very thankful that Barnabas chose that sermon and that text, actually. And then this last week, then Barnabas preached on logos, that Greek word that refers to the overall story of Scripture, God's overall story for his people, for all people, is this. That the only place where we can find true freedom, true life, true happiness, is in God's Son, Jesus Christ. So to conclude our series today, because this is the final one for us, I'm going to teach you another Greek word. You heard logos last week. Today's word is rhema. Want to say it? <laughs> rhema. Okay. It's a Greek word that means, it's a word that means actually a word specifically spoken. A word that is uttered in speech or writing a specific word at a specific time to a specific person. We find this word about 75 times in the New Testament. And this word is a reminder that although the scripture is God's word spoken to a specific person, to a specific, um, at a specific time, at a specific place, maybe to a specific people even, and much of it is written to people who lived 2,000 some years ago, it is still a word that speaks to us today. God's word is a word that has unique power and authority and relevance for us today if we are willing to listen. So as you sing God's word this morning, as you read God's word, as you pray it, as you hear God's word, I encourage you to ask, what is God's word for me today? I encourage you to pray, God, help me to hear your word for me this morning. Let us come to God in prayer. Holy God, open our ears, open our hearts, open our lives to your word, the word that you want to speak to each of us today. And I pray, God, that each of us will leave here changed because we have been in your presence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Join with me then in the call to worship. You will find it printed in your bulletin in the order of worship this morning. 
And if you would please stand. From Psalm 119, I love these words. O oh God, you are our hiding place and our shield. Our lips pour forth praise because you teach us your statutes. Holy God, we hope in your word. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Your righteousness is righteous forever, and your law is true. Make your face shine upon your servants, and teach us your statutes. is found printed in our bulletin this morning when we come before a holy God and recognize God for truly who God is we cannot but help but recognize that we fall short that we are not God and so we confess to God and acknowledge where we have sinned let us share in the prayer of confession together holy God your word calls us to be holy as you are holy to love as you have loved us, to forgive as we have been forgiven. Forgive us, O Lord, when we are hearers of your word, but not doers of it. Search us and know our hearts. Test us and know our thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in us, and lead us in the way everlasting. Amen. Hear the words, the assurance of forgiveness from Psalm 103. The Lord does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. So friends, let us walk in that forgiveness, sharing God's grace with our neighbors just as God has been gracious to us 
through Jesus Christ. Amen. Hymn number 425, it continues to be words from God's word. Cleanse me, and I invite you to share in that hymn with me this morning. you heard those words as you were singing them this morning. The last verse, O holy God, revival comes from thee. Send a revival. Start the work in me. Many years ago, I attended Westminster Presbyterian Church in Aurora, Illinois, and I remember praying for revival in, in that congregation. And guess what, friends? God started the revival with me. So be careful when you pray for revival. Let us come to God now for a time of congregational prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, you are a Savior who knows our every weakness, and you care for us still. God, you know every day that has been written in our book of life, even before one of them came to be. You know every word that we want to speak, even before it's on our lips. You know our thoughts. God, you know everything about us, and you love us as we are. And yet you refuse to let us stay that way. God, you want us to be more like Jesus every day. And so we pray for your grace, for your Holy Spirit, for your power to be more and more the men and women that you desire us to be. 
God, you are a God who cares. God, for those in our congregation and those in our community who are grieving on this day, those who are grieving the death of a loved one, a husband, a father, a grandfather, and a friend. God, for those who are grieving that slow death of a loved one struggling with dementia or Alzheimer's, for those who are grieving the end of a marriage, a broken relationship with a son or a daughter, the loss of a dream, God, may your holy word bring hope and may your Holy Spirit fill them with your peace. For those in our church family and our community who are hospitalized or in long-term care facilities, God, we pray for them this morning. For those who have been recently diagnosed with a life-threatening disease, for those who are currently undergoing treatments for cancer, those who struggle with emotional and psychological issues that are often hidden from view, but just as debilitating and distressing. God, may your holy word bring comfort, and may your Holy Spirit fill them with your peace. We pray for those, God, who in these summer months are celebrating anniversaries, those who have enjoyed many years of marriage together, as well as those just starting out. Thank you, God, for the covenant of marriage, that union of a man and a woman who together become one flesh, that union and relationship that reflects the relationship between Christ and his church. Holy God, protect our marriages and the marriages of those whom we love. Give us the courage and the grace and the strength to fight for our marriages so that they will reflect your grace, your compassion, and your love. God, in these summer months, we enjoy a different pace to life, and yet may we keep pace with you, O oh God, and with your word for us. Help us to be a people who love your word, who listen to your word, who obey your word. And so, God, hear us now as we pray the words your son taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As I said at the beginning of the service, today we're focusing on God's word, that specific word at a specific time, at a specific place, to a specific person. The Greek word hrema is the word that's used most often in the New Testament to mean that kind of word. For example, we find the word hrema in Luke Chapter 1, verse 38. The angel has come to the young woman, Mary, and tells her that she is to be the mother of God's son. And Mary responds, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be to me according to your word. Rhema. A word specifically spoken to a specific person at a specific time. We find the word rhema again in Luke chapter 3, verse 2. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. The word of God, rhema of God. Now, not since the prophet Malachi had God spoken to God's people through a prophet. So here we have a specific word that is spoken by God in this case, 
at a specific time after almost 500 years of silence to a specific person, John, the son of Zechariah. The word of God that came to John was a message of repentance, of baptism, of preparation for the Messiah. It was a word that was to be shared and preached to others. Friends, the word of God still speaks to us in specific ways and to specific people today. It's, yes, it's a, it's a lot of stories about people who lived a couple thousand years ago, and, and yet it is so much more. It is a word that speaks to us today if we are willing to listen. So let's turn then to God's word for us today. I encourage you to find the Bible closest to you in the pew. Uh, we're looking at the words from the Gospel of John, the end of the sixth chapter. You can find those words on page 1658 in your pew Bibles. When we get to this point in John, in the Gospel of John, chapter 6 especially, we see that Jesus has been teaching at a synagogue in Capernaum. He's been speaking to his disciples, is what our text says. Now the phrase here refers not only to the 12 men who are closest to Jesus, but to a whole crowd of people who have been following Jesus. Many of the people in the crowd and many of the people listening to Jesus in this instance have just seen him feed 5,000 people. And then they followed him here all the way to Capernaum as well, and now they are in the synagogue listening as Jesus is teaching. So it's his closest disciples and then other followers as well. And these are some of the things that Jesus has said to them so far, and you can find these in the beginning part of John chapter 6. He said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus said, I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus said, Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. So let's turn now to John chapter 6, verse 60, and see how the crowd responds to Jesus' words. Looks like I'm going to have to find it in my Bible first. Here we go. And we'll just read through verse 69. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned, the disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words, Rhema, of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, my rock and our salvation. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, what took place in the synagogue at Capernaum that day was not just an ordinary conversation. It's not like the disciples just heard a nice lecture, you know, words that challenge the intellect, that speak to the brain, that communicate ideas. They didn't just hear an inspirational message, words that grab the heart and touch the emotions. Jesus' words were different because they were words of a spiritual nature. As Jesus says, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words, the rhema, that I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. In the synagogue that day, Jesus was using physical terms to speak about a spiritual reality. To know Jesus as the bread of life and to eat his flesh is to trust or believe in Jesus. The Holy Spirit works in and through the words that Jesus speaks to touch more than the intellect, to reach more than the heart. The Holy Spirit works in and through Jesus' words to touch the spirit and the soul, to awaken genuine spiritual life. And yet, not everyone in the crowd that day is able to hear them at a spiritual level. Some of the people that were there that day were simply had followed Jesus. Last time they'd seen him, he had done this big miracle. They were waiting for another miracle to take place. And maybe they'd get a free meal out of it again this time too. But then to hear Jesus' words in the synagogue, they were just too tough for them to understand. Others just were not willing to trust him completely. So they bailed. They left. The English Standard Version says, After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. It was a turning point for them. And many of them chose to turn away. Jesus sees that many of the crowd have left, and so he turns to the twelve, those 12 men closest to him, and he, then he says to them, so do you want to leave too? And Peter, the self-appointed spokesperson for the disciples, says, Lord, what other teacher are we going to go to? Only you have the words of eternal life. We believe and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Friends, the Word of God still speaks in specific ways to us today if we are willing to listen. And friends, the Word cannot speak to us if it is sitting on our bookshelf at home, if it's gathering dust on the coffee table. It cannot speak to us in its totality if we only read our favorite passages over and over again. It cannot speak to us if we do not know what the Word says. The author of the book of Hebrews writes these powerful powerful words. He writes, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And it continues, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith 
we profess. Reading God's word, and maybe this is why we sometimes don't like to read it, <laughs> but reading God's word is really like shining a flashlight under a, your bed when you're looking for something, you know? That bright light shows up every gum wrapper, every dirty sock, every dust bunny that is hidden underneath there. Well, God's word is like that as well, isn't it? And God's word has the power to transform us if and only if we are willing to interact with it. We are willing to listen to it. Maybe you know the Logos, that the overall story of Scripture. But what is God saying, God's word saying specifically to you? On Sunday mornings, just as we did today, I encourage you every Sunday as you prepare for worship to pray, God, what is your word for me today? And then also, as you study God's word, maybe in Ernie's Sunday school class at 1030, or maybe in a woman's circle, or in a small group Bible study, ask God, what is your word for me today? And be ready then to hear what it says. When you open your Bible to read it at home, ask God, what is your word for me today? And be ready to hear what God says. Because God's words are spirit and life. Through the Holy Spirit, they speak to the spirit in us. And they can lead to eternal life. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Now I want to offer up a summer challenge to all of you. Ask yourself this question. Outside of Sunday morning, how often do I read the Bible? Outside of Sunday mornings, how often do I listen to a sermon? preached on God's word, either on the radio or I watch it on the internet. Outside of Sunday mornings, how often do I interact with God's word? The word of God still speaks to us, my friends. It still speaks to us, and yet we need to interact with it in order to be able to listen to what it says. The word of God still speaks to us today in specific ways if we are willing to listen and then do what it says. Hmm. You heard me refer to this in the children's sermon last week, James chapter 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. It's a powerful image, isn't it? Last week in the children's sermon, I had a mirror for the kids to look at, right? God's word is like a mirror. If we look at it, and if we hear what it says, we read it, but we don't do it, then we're falling short, aren't we? I better look at it too. Okay. <laughs> so when you hear, when you leave church on Sunday morning and you say to the pastor, nice sermon, do you think about it during the week? Do you do what it says? Or do you forget about it? Until the next Sunday. When you read the Bible or you hear a sermon, does your mind immediately go to that 
other person who you wish could be here this morning to hear this sermon. Or maybe when you read the Bible, do you read it and then you kind of pat yourself on the back for having done so? Good job, okay. Or do you strive by the power of the Holy Spirit then to apply it and to do what it says? There is a difference. Friends, we need to be doers of the word of God, not just hearers only. And finally, God's word still speaks to us today if we are willing to listen and then respond. If you get Worship Advance, it's an email that Chris Ward sends out every week to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship on Sunday morning. You'll notice that his email is outlined the same way every week. First, read the scripture, God's word to you. Then, reflect on the scripture and consider the implications of the text. Renew your, your perspective on life based on scripture, and then finally respond as God moves you out into the world. If you look through our bulletin, the order of worship as well, let's see if I can find mine, you'll see it's the same thing, right? I can't find mine, but I'm sure you can find yours. First of all, worship. We offer our lives to God. Then discipleship. We grow in the image of Christ. And notice that it says by the, by the scripture reading, God's word for today. And then finally it says mission. We take part in the Spirit's work. That's another way of saying we respond to God's word. God's word still speaks to us today. It is intensely personal. And it demands a response. God's word to you might be different than God's word to you or to you. And yet God's word speaks to each of us. God meets each of us where we are at. And God is willing to be patient and to wait and to give us the grace until we are ready to respond as well. I spoke recently with a woman who is a new Christian. I'll call her Susan. Susan had not grown up going to church. As an adult, though, she knew a lot of people who were Christians and who had attended church all their lives. They knew that God existed. They had a confidence about their faith. And she wondered, how do they know? How do they know for sure? So over many years, she kept kind of asking and wondering and talking to people, pursuing something. So she talked to her husband about this, about this desire to check out church more, to know more, and her husband loved her and supported her and said, okay, I'll go with you. And so they started going to church. When they got to church, though, they looked around and they thought, we're the only ones. We're the only ones here who don't get it. Everybody else seemed to belong but us. And they both felt such heavy expectations. What if they said yes to this church thing? What if they said yes to this Jesus thing? What would be expected of them? Were they going to have to go out and start preaching, you know, going door to door and evangelizing people or something, they weren't ready for that. It was scary. It was hard. But Susan kept coming to church. And she heard a pastor say, God made each of us hear the words that you have for each of us today. And she thought, okay, I can wait until I hear God's word for me. And then she heard a pastor say, who is Jesus to you? Is he just a good man, a great teacher, a positive role model, or is he something more? Is he God? 
and she knew she had to make a decision. She had to decide what she was going to do with everything that she heard on Sunday morning. And she was afraid. You see, Susan is an amazingly intelligent woman. She likes to reason, to analyze, to figure things out. It's a real gift of hers. And, that, and yet she knew that for her, this decision, this response to this whole God thing, it was a decision of the heart. It was a decision to trust, to give herself to something, someone that she didn't fully understand. She was seeking, yes, that whole time, many years, and yet all those years too, God was drawing her closer and closer to him. Friend, maybe you are a faithful student of the Bible. You love God's word. You sincerely seek to hear God's word and do what it says. If so, this is my prayer for you, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Or maybe you have attended church a long time. You've heard lots of sermons over the years, and if you have been to more Christmas Eve services than you can count. Maybe you even have a favorite spot here in the sanctuary on Sunday mornings. But maybe you have never listened to God's word for you. Or maybe this whole Jesus thing, this whole church thing is new to you. If it is, be patient. Keep listening. God is knocking on the door of your heart. And God will keep knocking until you are ready to let him in. Friend, is the word of God active? living in your life? Are you a hearer of the word and a doer as well? The word of God speaks to us still if we are willing to listen. Let us pray. Holy God, may we truly be hearers of the word and doers as well. May we truly spend time in your word, getting to know your word. May we be willing to hear what it says. And then, God, we pray for that courage, that grace, that strength to respond, to accept, to go forward. Perhaps your word is calling us to love. Perhaps your word is calling us to forgive. Perhaps your word is calling us to persevere. God, speak to us today, to each of us. You know each of us. You know where we are at. You know where our hearts are with you. And so speak to each person here and meet them on this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> In your order of worship, you will find the affirmation of faith. Each week in this series, we have been using words from one of our confessions to remind us again of what we believe in as Presbyterian Christians, what we believe in as Christians. There it is. Order of worship. Okay. Let us affirm then these words of faith from the Westminster Larger Catechism. Let us read them in unison together. The Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are the Word of God, the only rule of faith and obedience. The Scriptures manifest themselves to be the Word of God by their majesty and purity, and by their light and power to convince and convert sinners, to comfort and build up believers unto salvation. But the Spirit of God is alone, 
able fully to persuade us that they are the very Word of God. So friends, whether you have walked with Jesus for many years, or you're still figuring out what this Jesus Church Christianity thing is all about, you know, it doesn't really matter. Because at the foot of the cross, we are all sinners. None of us are perfect. All of us need a savior. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me, she who comes to me, will never go hungry. And the one who believes in me will never go thirsty. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Let us pray together. Holy God, we praise you because you are all powerful love. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who lived for us, who died for us, and who lives and reigns in heaven still. We come to you now welcoming your grace, accepting your forgiveness, celebrating with you and with each other your free gift of salvation available to all who trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus shared one final meal with his disciples, with those 12 men who were the closest with him, who had seen pretty much every meal, every miracle that he had accomplished, who had, ate, had eaten almost every meal with him. And this was one final meal that they shared together then. At the end of it, he took a loaf of bread, he blessed it, and then he broke it. And he said, friends, this is my body. I am the bread of life. He who believes in me will never go hungry, will never be thirsty. And so this is my body broken for you. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks, he blessed it, and he said, this is my blood shed for you to cover all of your sins. This cup represents the new covenant, a new relationship that I have with you and with all who believe. Those are the words that Jesus said back then, 2,000 years ago. Friends, these are words spoken for us today. The bread of life, the cup of life. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. As you share in God's word this morning and as you share with the sacraments, we'll first be distributing the wafers. And as you pass the plate, I invite you to do so with the words, the body of Christ broken for you.
friends, as you share the cup of life, I invite you to do so with your neighbor saying the words, the cup, what are the words? The blood of Christ shed for all of your sins. <laughs> and we hold the cup and drink it together because, one, number one, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and it reminds us that we are unified in Christ in that reason. And also then, to reflect our unity in Jesus Christ as well. So please hold the cup as well. that we have done and the wrongs that have been done to us. They have been nailed at the cross and the blood of Christ washes them away. Friends, this is the gift of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Holy God, Almighty One, we thank you. We give you all glory, all honor, all praise. We know that this is just a foreshadowing. This event that we have shared will be multiplied 20-fold when we share the celebration in heaven with you one day. God, we give you all glory, all honor, and all praise in your Son's precious name. Amen. Friends, we have been blessed. We have been given so much. And so we take this time now during worship to share of that which can be very meaningful and very close to our hearts, our finances as well. And so we share our gift at this time as an act of worship to give glory to God. pray. Holy God, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so, God, we offer these gifts to you as a way to say thank you. Use them, multiply them to spread the good word of the gospel of Jesus Christ in our community and around the world. We pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. Our final hymn is hymn number 29. We'll sing the first and the third verses. First and the third.
you have come here this morning with a burden that is on your heart, a concern for yourself, for a loved one. Our, this, our Stephen minister is here to pray with you. Ernie will be here to pray with you this morning. Perhaps God's word has spoken to you in a powerful way this morning. Ernie is here to speak with you as well and to pray with you for you um, or for, for someone that you love. So as you go this week, um, I encourage you to open God's Word, to read God's Word, to hear it and to do what it says by the grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so go in peace and be God's Word to the world as well. Amen. Amen.